Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Before you ask, yes, I am sitting on the floor of my apartment. Trying to get good lighting here is actually a lot harder than I thought. Like our apartment is so light and bright and open but it just doesn't translate to film so I'm literally sitting on the floor. Anyway, this is a video that I've been really excited to make. It's a topic that I am super passionate about and that is the presence of healthy fats in the diet. Since I started studying exercise and nutrition science, I've constantly had people asking me for nutritional advice. And when the subject of fats come up, people kind of freak out a little bit. And I get it. We've kind of been fed this narrative that eating fat makes you fat. And if you're trying to be healthy and lose weight, wouldn't eating something that's gonna make you fat be counterintuitive? But I just wanna tell you that that is wrong. It is so, so wrong. Eating fats does not make you fat. In fact, eating any macronutrient, whether it's fats, carbs, or protein, isn't going to make you fat. What causes the human body to retain or increase its adipose tissue stores, adipose tissue are our fat stores on our body. What causes us to increase those stores is an imbalance between energy expenditure and energy input. So basically in the most shrewd, crude and basic way of saying it, energy in versus energy out or calories in versus calories out. For the most part, what causes people to gain weight is an imbalance between the energy they consume and the energy they expend. Yes, gram for gram, fats are more calorically dense than carbs and proteins. So um, fats are nine calories per gram and carbs and protein are four calories per gram. But in saying this, this doesn't mean that there's something to be afraid of. We actually consume a lot of various different types of fats in our diets. We've got like triglycerides, sterols, phytosterols, free fatty acids. Yeah, there's, there's a heap. So today I really wanna focus on a fatty acid. So fatty acids are a carboxylic acid group attached to a carbon chain. And if this isn't making any sense, I'm really sorry. I will do my best to explain it. I promised some science on this channel and this topic is very chemistry based. So there will be some some chemistry in here. As I said, there is a carboxylic acid group and it's attached to a carbon chain. Fatty acids can be grouped into saturated fatty acids or unsaturated fatty acids and then can be further grouped from there. So we often hear and talk about unsaturated and saturated fats and how one is good for us and one isn't good for us and what, what are they? So when referring to saturation of a fatty acid, it means that the carbon chain that exists on the molecule is completely saturated with hydrogens. So carbon is one of those molecules, it likes to bind to everything. It, it makes four bonds, it wants to fill all of those four spaces on each carbon. Saturation refers to all potential spots where hydrogen can be, hydrogen is. Unsaturated fats, on the other hand, mean that not all spots where hydrogen can be are filled, so it's not saturated with hydrogens. In the case of an unsaturated fatty acid, it basically means that those spots on the carbon chain where hydrogen could potentially bond be bonded isn't completely filled with hydrogens. So some will be there and some won't be there. So this occurs in unsaturated fatty acids because somewhere in the chain of carbons, two carbons have decided to become best friends and have like joined together twice, making a double bond. And what this does in turn is create little kinks in the carbon chain. So because saturated fats don't contain any double bonds, their molecular structure is a lot more stable than that of an unsaturated fat. Molecules of saturated fats are linear because they don't have those little kinks in them caused by double bonds. And therefore they're able to stack and pack more closely and tightly together. This creates a really dense structure when all the molecules come together and it increases their intermolecular interaction. So they pack closely together and think of it as them being like more tightly knit. So when they're exposed to heat, they don't degrade as quickly because they're much more packed 
closely together. So it means when you're cooking with them, they don't melt or smoke as quickly. Contrary to that, when we're talking about unsaturated fats, because they do have these double bonds and these kinks are existing in the chain, they're not able to pack as tightly together. And in fact, the more double bonds that are present in an unsaturated fat, the less stable it actually is. So like I said, they're not able to pack together and therefore their intermolecular relationships or intermolecular interactions aren't as strong. So when they are exposed to heat or you're cooking with them, they degrade a lot quicker. So with this in mind, when it comes to cooking, especially frying like on really high heats, I prefer to cook with a saturated fat mainly coconut oil for the most part. Not only is it a great source of lauric acid, which is an antimicrobial and fights off bacteria, but it's got a really high smoke point. So I can put it in the pan and cook on really high heats without it degrading as quickly. And you guys might be thinking, Rhea, why is this important? Well, reason being, when lipids are put under heat, they undergo certain physiological and chemical changes, including oxidation, a hydrolysis, and a polymerization. Basically, can, if the heat is high enough, cause them to become carcinogenic compounds, which aren't very good for us. And you can you can physically see this happening too sometimes. So if you've left like a little bit of olive oil in the pan, rushed off somewhere to do something and you come back and you can see it smoking and it smells, yeah, that is not good. <laughs> the oils will often not smell great, they'll darken and they'll often become frothy. Yeah, this can lead to harmful outcomes if oils are consumed after they've basically gone rancid. By no means am I saying that you need to be putting copious amounts of coconut oil into your pan you really don't need much, just enough to make sure your food isn't sticking or burning. And also, I'm not saying that unsaturated fats are bad for us. They just often aren't the best for cooking with. While we're on the subject of unsaturated fats, I just want to dive a little deeper. So unsaturated fats can also be further categorized into cis monounsaturated fats and cis polyunsaturated fats. Mono means that there is one double bond and poly means that there are more. And cis means that whenever a double bond occurs, the rest of the chain on either side are going in the same direction. There are also trans fats, and these are the ones that we often hear about that are really not that great for us. Trans fats are a form of unsaturated fatty acids, but because they're like oils, they've been partially hydrogenated, that is the term. Manufacturers often try to add extra hydrogens to these unsaturated fatty acids to make them straighter or to make them more solid. So typical form Forms of trans fats are like margarine, they're often found in certain processed foods. Butter has a few trans fats in it, but they're naturally occurring, so they don't have the same problematic effects in our physiology. They are also unsaturated fats as well. So before we move on, let's reiterate what we've talked about so far. So we have saturated fatty acids. That means that there are no double bonds, all hydrogen positions are filled, and they have the highest smoking point. Then we've got monounsaturated fatty acids. Acids, meaning there are one, one double bond, not all hydrogen positions are filled and they have a lower smoking point. And then we have polyunsaturated fat, which have multiple double bonds, not all hydrogen positions are filled and they happen to have the lowest smoking point and they are not actually synthesized by the body. So we actually need to consume polyunsaturated fats because we don't make them. We don't make them in our body, so we need to get them from our diet. This brings us to the infamous omega-3s and omega-6s. Omega-3s and omega-6s are classified as essential fatty acids because like I said, if we don't consume them in our diet, we don't have them in our body. Essential fatty acids are important structural components of our cell membranes. They help keep them fluid and without them, if they become too rigid, it means that our cell membranes are less permeable and certain essential nutrients can't get through. So there are different forms of omega-3s. You've got EPA, DHA, and ALA. DHA and EPA are especially needed for fetal development and during infancy because they help develop our retina and they help form our cognitive development. They're also needed throughout the rest of our life cycle to help regulate nerve transmission and to help produce HDL, which is like our good cholesterol. ALA is the precursor to DHA and EPA. ALA, so alpha linoleic acid, is the omega-3s that come from plant-based foods like walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds. These essential fatty acids are also 
precursors to ecosinoids. 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 Yeah. I love me some biochemistry. Hey, love that nothing is like easily pronounced. It's great. The carcinoids are hormone-like molecules that are involved in hormonal synthesis, cell regulation, temperature regulation, uh, circadian rhythm, and immune response. They are also part of the inflammatory responses in our body. So carcinoids from omega-6s are pro-inflammatory, whereas the ones from omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. So they are some of the functions of unsaturated fats in our body, but saturated fats too have a plethora of functions. Firstly, they're needed for fat-soluble vitamin absorption, so A, D, E, and K. A myelin sheath as well, the white matter that covers our nervous system, or our, our nerves I should say, is also created from saturated fats. Saturated fats also make up our lung surfactant. Lung surfactant are lipid molecules that line our lungs and prevent them from collapsing and protect them from and pathogens as well. So I guess the next logical question is where do we find these dietary fats? So great examples of saturated fats are coconut oil, palm oil, but I'm kind of not really on board with the whole palm oil thing because of how it's like made. Um, cacao butter, cacao butter is actually a really good one. Um, what else? Oh, and animal fats as well. Yeah, so lard, butter, and animal fats. Monounsaturated fats can be found in olive oil, canola oil, which is also a really rich source of omega-3 ALA, and peanut oil. Polyunsaturated fats can be found in sunflower oil, safflower oil, corn, soybean oil, and some nuts as well. Omega-3 EPA and DHA can be found in like fatty fish like salmon. Omega-3 ALA can be found in flax seeds, walnuts, and hemp seeds. Omega-6s are found in chicken, dairy, eggs, nuts, and avocado. Like I said before, trans fats are found in butter, tub margarine, stick butter, some dairy-free cheeses, and some faux meat products as well as other processed foods. Okay, so now we know what a fat is, we know what their molecular structure is, and we know where to find them. Let's briefly talk about the guidelines for fat intake. So I'm going to refer to the NRVs, and the NRVs are the nutrient reference values, and these are set out by the Australian government and the Medical Research Council. According to the NRVs, total fat intake should be between 20 to 35% of your total energy intake. That is 20 to 35% of your calories coming from fat. According to the NRVs, saturated and trans fat together should be limited to no more than 10% of your estimated daily intake. They also state that omega-3 should equate to 0.2% of our intake as well. The NRV state that we should aim to replace energy-dense, nutrient-poor foods, so junk food, with foods rich in long-chain omega-3s like tuna, salmon, and other omega-3-containing foods. I just want to preface these statements though and start by saying that if you are low-carb or keto or have discussed with your dietitian, nutritionist, GP, a diet plan or meal plan that doesn't stick to or adhere to these nutrient reference values and it is working for you, then that is amazing. I know for me personally, I would probably go over these reference values because I add a source of healthy fat to every single meal. We have to remember that these values are great for giving the overall population a general guideline for healthy eating. Most of the RDIs, that's your recommended daily intake, that are set out by the Australian government are to prevent deficiencies or to prevent disease. I will say it so, so, so many times. There is no one size fits all to nutrition. It's very, very personalized. Some people thrive on a higher fat diet. Other people thrive on a higher carb diet. Either way, this is just a topic that I am so, so passionate about. And I really want to educate people more on it because I just get so frustrated when I hear young girls saying that they aren't eating any fat because they don't want to get fat. I hope this video has educated you guys and sort of highlighted that we do need to have healthy fats in our diet for basic physiological functions of our body. If you liked this video guys, please give it a thumbs up because it really does help my channel and don't forget to subscribe and to hit the little notification bell so you get notified every time that I upload and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!